hi everyone. So um, I thought I'd give a little bit of a sharing about what we're doing here in Singapore, with uh, in particular with InnerSource. So, so a little bit of background about us. Um, GovTech is you know, what is effectively the, the central technology function for much of the Singapore government. We focus primarily on the citizen facing things for what is our smart nation vision. We don't cover off the military. We don't cover off health as much. But for really what we're doing, it's, uh, it's helping enable these sorts of digital services to citizens in government, um, as well as providing uh, central platforms and products that uh, we use to help enable the developer community across the wider government, as well as services to enable both better practice as well as the engagement um, through various different uh, parts of the organization. So um, it's quite an interesting uh, interesting part and quite similar to some of the other uh, more progressive governments out there with this sort of central function, UKGBS and, and some of the, uh, the uh, various different agencies in the US as well. So, um, you know, for me itself, I'm a distinguished engineer here at GovTech. And, you know, I, um, when I joined GovTech about five years ago, um, I'd come from a background that, that involved a lot of open source. And so coming into government, it sort of surprised me in, in seeing that, uh, you know, we really didn't have that culture of, of collaboration in something that, you know, really would make sense and have a lot of benefit. The, the Singapore government itself, you know, at least for what we're responsible for is roughly sort of 90 to 100 agencies of di varying different levels of technical maturity, as well as the, um, you know, the engagement that they have both for in-house development, as well as engagement with vendors and outsourcing. So it's a very diverse and mixed environment. Um, but the level of collaboration was fairly low. And so I think, you know, these are the sorts of challenges that we probably see in a lot of organizations. You know, we, we, in some ways we can think of, you know, the government as being a fairly large multinational. We have so many different agencies we deal with, all, you know, as independent entities, all working together with very similar goals. Um, but, you know, these sorts of things that we see are, are, are very common across a lot of organizations. You know, the three key areas that we really started to look at, I'm sure are very familiar um, to all of us who've, who've dealt with this in, in the past or currently. So, you know, the lack of discoverability, the, 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 the collaboration that really gets locked, you know, developers getting stuck in their own silos and, you know, the kind of visibility, the transparency that we lose from, you know, code being distributed into various different platforms, you know, held by vendors, you know, all of these things that, you know, we really lose these benefits that, that come about. So one of the things that, you know, I really wanted to start to drive was this culture in the organization to you know, really start to see how we can think about this. And it was, um, you know, really a, you know, an interesting approach because what we really started to see was these practices that we had in government were, were very, very binary. We either had open, we did a bit of open source, and if you have seen some of the areas that we've released open source, it's around, say, you know, our tracing technologies for COVID, you know, or, you know, some of the other areas around, uh, you know, API gateways and, 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 and parts around there. But most of those are quite specific to what we do. Um, on the other side is really that kind of very silo, that, um, that single project, you know, teams working in isolation. We missed out on, you know, this kind of, um, you know, uh, means of, of doing anything in between. And I think that's really where we started to think about what were the benefits of the platform. Now, you know, I'm sure as, you know, this is the, the commons, you know, we're, we're very familiar with the benefits of, of open source. And, you know, but in taking this to our leadership, we really had to kind of explain this from first principles. Now, I think, you know, our leadership team understood the importance of it in terms of improving collaboration, which is why, you know, the title of my talk is more around the collaborative side of it. Um, rather than the benefits of, you know, the code community and, and, and other things, but, you know, very, very intertwined and very, very relevant. And so part of that is really looking back to these challenges that we saw around discovery, you know, internal code sharing, documentation and knowledge, the collaboration around the community, the learning and the competency that follows on, as well as that kind of transparency so that we can see all of these sorts of uh, practices 
um, understand where code lives and, and really kind of bringing it all together. Now, you know, really, you know, the outcome we wanted to have was really just that we start to kind of open up this continuum, paint with a few more colors in our brush, so to speak, you know, we're going from the open and the close to being able to think about where open source fits across this spectrum of this continuum. And, you know, for us, GovTech was the easiest starting point. We control it. We don't necessarily force the rest of government to follow on from us, even though we also are in some ways providing the, the, the regulatory function of writing policy for the rest of government to follow. Inner sources at that stage, and, you know, is the, it's not something we necessarily want to mandate. Certainly early on, while, it, you know, it, it, there may be some cases where we do want to, you know, encourage open collaboration and force it, we wanted to start somewhere organically to really bring this out. And so, you know, we wanted to start in our own backyard, demonstrate that there was value before we start to really think about the other parts. But, you know, if the rest of government decided, you know, that they wanted to adopt it, by all means. So, you know, the interesting challenge was that, you know, we have this sort of vendor landscape that, uh, that goes on beyond just for what we have in, you know, the government, but also to the engagement. And so, you know, seeing how that kind of fits in, and that's a little bit more of the, the next steps as we're starting to think about is how do we incentivize vendors, the outsourced agencies, you know, the big consulting companies to actually engage in these sorts of things too. Uh, interesting challenge and one I haven't got a perfect answer for at this stage, but we did go along in some ways to, to start to look at that as well, or at least to be, uh, um, you know, consider it as we go forward. So, you know, let, let's go into a bit more detail about our journey. So, um, you know, we really started to think about what were those key principles as, as you know, inner source in the organization. You know, part of that is the openness and the transparency and the collaboration back to the, the stuff that we think about. So, um, you know, all of these things came in around the discoverability of code, um, the, you know, the practices that we're, you know, familiar with both in open source as well as, you know, the inner source, the patterns that we see and the great work that's being done in the community here, as well as the collaboration piece and bringing out what, you know, is, uh, you know, typically done quite formally inside the organization, but bringing that organically into the code repositories that will be made available, teams that can contribute pull requests and, you know, at least engage on different levels that, you know, really when everything's so strongly siloed, we're just not there in the first place. And so that really became our key driving piece. Now, you know, we started to look at this as we framed it, certainly to leadership about, you know, three key areas that we wanted to focus on for successful inner sourcing. One was platform. And so, you know, really thinking about how a single code platform, much like how GitHub has become the, you know, de facto standard for open source, we needed to have something internally in government because we had such a fragmented landscape. You know, the practices that follow on, both the uh, you know great uh, great patterns that the, the Commons is, is, uh, has released and is obviously working on, as well as the context, the guidelines that make sense inside of government. Um, much of it's applicable, but you know there's always some interesting nuance that uh, that comes as part of that. And finally, the people being able to raise awareness. You know, this was a really interesting part that sort of surprised me a little bit in in as we started to get out there. Um, the the areas that, you know, may not have been somewhat expected, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail later on. So as part of that, we really came about and what we framed out in an inner source working group. Um, and so the first part, the platform, you know, that was really a key piece. Um, as I mentioned, we've had a very fragmented landscape in terms of these sort of code collaboration tools. In some cases, they just didn't exist at all. People were sending around zip files. On the other hand, we probably, you know, we had a fair use of the GitHubs and the, you know, the Bitbuckets and all of these, you know, very familiar tools. But what we really wanted to do was start to bring things back again. Um, not necessarily because we wanted to force a tool, but because it just made it a lot easier. We could establish these practices. The visibility was in a central place. Um, and so that really became, you know, back on um, a, uh, a team that we have internally, um, we call SHIP, surprisingly. Um, and that one really was a code collaboration platform, CI, CD pipeline, very, very standard. 
Um, and that was something that we modernized from existing platforms and rolled out um, as a central platform for what we call the whole of government. So all of the agencies that we're responsible for. And so that's something that uh, could be subscribed to. Um, and the way that it operates, it is, you know, cost recovered. And, and so there was some friction early on about this kind of, you know, do you have to pay money to be involved in an inner source community? So we, some friction that came about as part of that. But when we started to really think about that, the accessibility of the platform became key. So some of the works that we did with this platform team, which is independent from, from inner source, is think about how we could reduce that bottleneck to say, you know, for those people who are doing only read-only code, you know, and not necessarily, um, you know, uh, raising pull requests, you know, all of these things, then, um, you know, we wanted to reduce that friction to avoid licensing costs and overhead to do it. And so we've come up with a way of doing that to at least allow automatic entry for guests to be able to review code, um, which somewhat surprised me at the start as to how difficult it was to do. But um, over time, that's become a bit more of an enabler. So everyone can have access to it if they so wish, including leadership versus just developers. So that, um, that's something that was an important part of it, at least to, to get the ball rolling. Um, you know, the community of practice, our inner source working group, we established at the end of 2021. And, you know, that was something that we just came together as a bit of an open community, somewhat informally, but we had regular sync ups both to talk about people's experience in open source communities in inner source, for that matter, if they have been doing it in previous organizations, but really starting to come together and think about what were our practices, you know, um, building out, you know, eating our dog food, um, do it with accessible code repositories and, and really doing this thing visibly. Um, and so it was... It was it was somewhat easy. I was surprised our, our leaders were very supportive of the initiative. Um, and so we could get that started. We, in fact, found other areas of friction, which I can you know, go into a little bit later. But this was a good starting point to really build things out again. Um, probably didn't go as fast as I would have expected, but certainly something that, you know, and, and that's my interesting feedback in government is government's always a little bit slow. The perception is, and while GovTech does move very quickly, um, not like the private sector. And I think that's something personally what I work on a lot in government um, is to help help, you know, help move more quickly. But it was sort of exacerbated and sometimes it was very visible in terms of that, you know, it just takes a long time, you know, and that's, um, you know, something we need to deal with as we work through and building out a community of practice too. So we really framed um, from some other great work in the community around you know, the three stages of inner source adoption. This may be fairly familiar. And, you know, we wanted to start from this as a way of at least helping the organization understand, um, you know, where we were in this uh, in these sorts of stages. Now, closed source is obviously the most fundamental part of it. You know, it's at level zero that we, you know, really it, there's no collaboration going on. Everything's closed and silent. That's the kind of present state. So we really wanted to think about where teams could, you know, move up on the ladder, move up on these sorts of levels from the really easy sort of just let's flip the switch to make it internal and, and, and have some recommendations there. Um, the guest contributions of at least accepting, you know, pull requests and merge requests. And finally, that, you know, kind of multi-team maintenance. And I think this is probably none too, um, you know, not too uh, unfamiliar, but it's something that we kind of needed to be quite, quite make, you know, make fairly explicit. Now, where it was really interesting was where we found this split. And so government, you know, there, there is this sort of fall to, um, you know, ask permission to do things. And, and that was, wasn't the intent. That's not the intent of uh, certainly for open source and inner source as a whole is it didn't, you just shouldn't have to necessarily go and get permission to go and do something. So, you know, when we first did this, we got a lot of inquiries to say, oh, can I open source, you know, can I inner source this project? And um, the answer was, yeah, well, of course, why are you coming and asking me? But it made me realize that um, there was some confusion in how they wanted to do it. A lot of the, the thought was what, you know, we sort of designated as community inner source, so at least to give it a label, a label was that, you know, it was a centrally, you know, open, potentially that kind of stage or level three of this kind of uh, community maintained and uh, and shepherded 
uh, approach to inner source. But um, that one, you know, for us, we, we needed to also kind of frame it as the kind of project initiated inner source as well. And this is something that, you know, at least in the structure and the organizations that we put into the code platform was that each team could flip the switch, make it internal, and, you know, as the, the starting point without having to go and get permission. You know, and so that um, that was something we needed to define a little bit more so that each team controlled their code. It really fits into that kind of stages one and two. Um, and, you know, they were really responsible for the governance. You know, there may be resources, you know, sort of um, developers who they're assigning to that or at least working on a project. So, you know, they can encompass it in their world as well as potentially any kind of budgets that they're dealing with. We also needed to make that split as well to really think about the community aspect of it. And so what we did do was develop a central uh, group inside um, our code platform specifically for these general projects that you know, may be of central utility, um, these code libraries, you know, infrastructure as code, um, things that may have um, wider use than maybe a specific project and also may be governed um, by multiple groups. So, you know, that's the area that we actually then needed to spend a bit more time both communicating, but also documenting because it, um, it came up time and time again about this kind of request. And so um, we didn't want to make the community aspect of, you know, donating code to the central community. Or, you know, if you think about open source foundations, the same kind of uh, approach, we didn't want to make it gatekeeping necessarily, but we didn't want to have <clears throat> stuff thrown over the wall. So we needed to kind of, Talk with the teams, understand where they're going with these things, and to see where that utility is, and you know, let it in somewhat organically now at the start, but certainly um, something that you know, as adoption grows, we we don't we need to think about this more carefully, and that's where I think other patterns come in, um, very relevantly around core teams, around uh, expectations for maintenance and things as well. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know, kind of back to this framing, you know, that the, we, we sort of broke it down into this project initiated ownership as well as this, you know, community stewardship. Um, and that helped sort of explain it a little bit more. Now, we also went to the point, I think, uh, of, of, you know, uh, at least having some guidelines and recommendations on how to adopt. And, um, you know, we're publishing this quite openly in our developers portal. Um, for not only for government to be able to view, but also for, for the rest of uh rest of the public internet to also go and have a look. And these really come down, I mean, we're very familiar with these things, I'm sure, from a lot of the patterns, but we wanted to you know, put it into something that was relevant for our teams. And so back to our kind of three key principles, we really started to look at the aspect of openness. You know, obviously the fundamental part is flicking that switch and saying internal rather than private. And a bit of tagging to make sure that the discovery, at least inside the code repositories, was somewhat there. Standard documentation is a critical part of it, and the licensing, at least to avoid any confusion. I don't think we're necessarily um, engaging lawyers in, in government to that extent, but certainly it's something that is useful, particularly if vendors are also getting involved. We didn't want vendors to go and <clears throat> take some code and then charge us back for it. Um, you know, all of these things, it's um, you know, a few areas we needed to really consider. So the transparency aspects of obviously accepting um, code contributions in a safe way, issue tracking, um, you know, transparent decision-making, you know, architecture decision records, documentation as code, all of these things. And as well, avoiding the, the kind of fragmentation that comes as a second, second order effect of somebody's running a JIRA and somebody's running everything else, coming back to kind of core tools was an important you know, area, at least to highlight, <clears throat> because the assumption may not be there in the first place. And finally, the kind of piece on, you know, the collaboration, the governance as, you know, looking at it and how it can be scaled even further. So this was a really starting point. And, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily something we wanted to require, but it was something that we wanted teams to think about when they started to inner source their projects. And that certainly, you know, um, isn't necessarily adopted entirely end to end, but certainly, um, you know, these things, we start to see the improvement as teams start to build things out again. I think we're probably quite familiar with the, the types of inner source roles, you know, the contributors, code reviewers, maintainers, trusted committers, all of those things. And I think for us <clears throat> in government, that wasn't as familiar. 
I think we needed to explain it a little bit more, not necessarily because the concepts were unfamiliar, but the formalization of terms, these things that, um, you know, we probably will talk about it in different language, um, potentially more traditional language, you know, sort of this kind of regulated piece about, you know, sort of, um, you know, segregation of duties, all of these things. We wanted to take, you know, a lot of those things that we're familiar with and apply them. So these are the things that we started to really think about both on the contributor, the code reviews, and the maintenance as to the language that we use. I left it up to the teams to define if there were specific parts of it as we went in. So more interesting, you know, going into the licensing part, we, we spent a lot of time with our uh, legal department um, working through what we call the, the GovTech public sector license. And it's a fairly straightforward permissive license, um, specifically for GovTech. Um, <clears throat> which covered the, you know, the use of code by licensees, um, somewhat about the vendors um, and, and the handling the, the contributions back again. We wanted to keep it very, very simple um, and sort of went to the point of not going to the depth of having um, you know, uh, other, other things to follow on with it in terms of DCOs and, and other, other parts. But you know, it, it was something that had a little bit of back and forth um, and it was really quite fortunate that our, our legal teams are really interested in this stuff too and, you know, really wanted to work through it. I mean, it's maybe it's a little bit more unique than, than some of the more dry contracts and things, but it certainly was um, uh, a useful part to at least cover and start this discussion on. And I think the next part is where, you know, engaging more with the rest of government is what they are going to do if they need to have the same, you know, licensing um, whether or not they fork and, and customize, whether they, or not they come up with something on their own, you know, we haven't quite got to that point yet because it's still really about the government, uh, the GovTech entity for at least where we control. But this is, you know, um, you know, sort of our starting point and uh, an interesting point as we we go and scale it across a larger organization. So, you know, we also needed to really start thinking about the measurements um, and sort of understanding. This, you know, the the adoption of, of you know, source and, and more widely, we, we really have, um, you know, started small and started quite simply and, and went to that point, at least as the reporting up to our leadership of uh, private versus inner source, that comparison, and somewhat skewed because we have a number of private repositories that would never be good candidates for inner source as well. Um, not necessarily because of its confidentiality or sensitivity, but it probably it's just noise in you know for the use of, of what these things are. So really digging through that and kind of coming up with cleaner data was a important part of that. Otherwise, it looked kind of very very woeful in terms of the adoption of Inosource very early on. But now things are starting to pick up, and I think the where we started to really think about was the quality of um, the, the the projects that were being released, as well as the. Um, the collaboration externally as well. So, you know, we started off, it was a GovTech initiative and much of the engagement was on teams who started to inner source their own projects um, inside of GovTech. But now we're starting to see a lot of teams coming externally and from even teams that we would never quite have expected in the first place um, coming and, and open sourcing infrastructure as code, uh, things that would <clears throat> in fact be useful, not necessarily contributing them back again, but working them in the open with visibility and so that there are areas now that sort of organically create that discussions, being able to bring things to the fore a little bit to um, see that there are things going on. And that's the sorts of outcomes that we really did want. We also developed a, a bit of a scorecarding tool to at least go through and um, assess a particular repository for best practice. Um, but it is something really that you know, we're now starting to capture those sorts of metrics and see where there are, you know, um, at least aligning with our leveling to understand um, the three stages of adoption, um, as well as the broader piece. And that's a little bit harder to determine, I think, I'd, you know, um, if anyone has any suggestions for that last piece about you know, measurement across an organization um, and the types of collaboration being multi-theme or, 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 or sort of, um, you know, accepting contributions, really interested to, to hear on, uh, on where that's going. So um, it's an interesting part as, as diving into that and reporting on it, but it's not the key piece. I mean, at the end of the day, we just wanted to get this out there and start raising awareness. Um, and I think over time, once we, you know, it gets a bit more um, 
bit more knowledge in the organization where we start to measure it a bit more for, for those kind of quality aspects. So adoption, you know, GovTech is obviously the key part. Our working group is eating our own dog food um, all the way. Um, and where we start to see is both the, the piece on our internal platforms, which, you know, have traditionally been uh, private and are now starting to be um, inner sourced uh, as part of that to know, you know, so teams can see how we build out our commercial cloud platform, at least the parts that provision accounts for uh, the big three CSPs. Um, as well, you know, our platforms for managing CICD, for example, all of these things, you know, really do then um, help in terms of teams understanding what's being done, contributing things back again. And, you know, the, the kind of lowest hanging fruit for a lot of those teams was not just opening the door on, you know, what, what could be a repository that they may not be quite comfortable in sharing to start off with, but carving off little pieces or building those community aspects for central uh, community uh, or utilities that could be then bought out first while they still then follow on with the kind of core code base for a lot of these things. So that's, that's the kind of model that we saw in a number of different teams who started this journey for uh, progressively in sourcing their projects. And one of the other areas now we're starting to think about with uh, certainly in GovTech is that in fact, we just um, put it in for that kind of inner source by default mentality or maybe with a mandate um, to say, you know, all projects that are inside of GovTech need to be in a source. Um, and that's something we're going back and forth about potential risks that follow <clears throat> or where there is exceptions to the rule that may make sense in that case, but that's going to be another important part of it. We don't want to force that too early but to see how that actually <clears throat> beds in um, with the, uh, the increasing usage of uh, inner source and the familiarity with the practices as well. So, you know, a little bit more about how we, uh, we came through, you know, the lessons learned. Um, platform accessibility was a key one. It was, uh, you know, limited it you know, to uh, only you know, users who had a paid account for the service which really was not the kind of the best approach for at least getting some knowledge and visibility of it. <clears throat> we wanted to be able to make it open for everyone, a little like we don't want to necessarily gate access to, you know, office tools, you know, corporate tools, you know, the same kind of thing. Code is a fundamental part of any kind of business. And so flipping that model and, and dealing with the Ministry of Finance to, to think about how we change our models for funding is an important one that we're really starting to dive into as well. Somewhat unique to our um, environment, but you know, not necessarily to Alien, I would imagine as well. The seeding of the community is an important part. I don't think the teams would probably necessarily do it uh, organically without both um, you know, sharing and, and understanding, talking about it. And that starts to you know, take some time to grow. And uh, you know, that was you know, sort of a fair amount of footwork going through and working with individual teams. It was running brown bags and sharing, as well as you know, bringing out, um, you know, into what is our, you know, sort of competency frameworks that we have for the organisation, um, or you know, chapters for various different aspects of our engineering practices, from software engineering to DevOps, to you know, start to share on those sorts of levels too. So, you know, it was an important part, um, even though you know the expectation is developers are probably a bit more familiar with that it was still a useful part because we have a lot of traditional um, roles that may have come into this, not necessarily from engineering first, but from, you know, um, other means of operations or um, you know, the other aspects there too. So the permission part was always an interesting one there. I talked a little bit about it in terms of, um, you know, the community versus project initiated. Um, it sort of surprised me a little bit in that of what needed to be spelled out. Maybe that was naivety on my part, but it was certainly something that I think we, um, uh, you know, had to had to spell out, had to make quite clear as to the different uh, models that we could take um, and how teams could select the best one for their particular situation. And also then, you know, graduation criteria, when it makes sense to move from one to the other. <clears throat> Allies and supporters, I think, are always important in any kind of change. Um, our leadership was very supportive of the initiative. In fact, some cases wanted to move things a lot faster um, when it probably couldn't have moved as fast. Um, 
But interestingly, the developers um, were, you know, uh, being a little bit more familiar with it, were okay with it. Um, they were more concerned about how much more work is this going to add to my job. Um, the middle management was the harder part. I think that kind of frozen middle, if we want to talk about it in that context, you know, there was that sort of, um, you know, further push on, you know, why do we need this? What, you know, is this a distraction? I've got limited resources. What about duplication in the kind of, you know, if somebody's working on a code library and, and somebody else is working on a similar one, how can we deconflict this? And, you know, that coming from a quite a traditional organization added friction and needed explanations and, and working through with teams. And so these are the areas that we really needed to sit down and work things through. Um, but, you know, overall beneficial, both for awareness and then learning, but also to start to change practices inside the organization for faster delivery, um, lighter process, all of these things that then followed on from that. So, you know, overall, you know, it's a transformation journey. It's, it's thinking about how we adopt um, what is sort of industry practice and <clears throat> bringing that to areas that may be a little less familiar. So I think with that, um, I've, I think I've got to the end of my slide. So 